jump right in. Mr. Jerinya Zungu, you are our tax expert. Um, I would like you to begin by addressing our officials from Zimra. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tendai. Uh, thank you, uh, the Zimra team, which is currently live with us. Uh, I don't know wow. if uh, maybe if they can put the videos, if it's possible. I don't know, Mr. Knowledge. Some of our audience is saying they want to see the faces behind the Zimra. I don't know if it's possible for them to go live. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy, for joining us. Uh, we'll, I think we'll start. So what we'll do is uh, the audience, because this, this webinar is not for us, it's for the Zimra officials to actually clarify to the, to, uh, to the taxpayers uh, the current uh, trends which are going on into the, in the tax system. They also want to know the new updates. Uh, so we'll be actually asking some prepared questions which we have to die. You can go ahead and start to ask those questions. Uh, then, as we will be asking these questions, uh, the audience are ready to prepare their own questions. Because uh, this uh, webinar, the Zimra is not going to present. They will be answering all your questions. So this webinar is for you, uh, the taxpayers, our clients. Feel free and ask the, the knowledgeable panel, which is currently with us. Uh, thank you, Tendai. I think we can start with the first question. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Just as I pull up the questions, I will ask Mr. Knowledge if you can adjust your camera. I see you are not clear yet. I'm not sure if that's an issue with your camera or something that we can rectify. Uh, I think it's something to do with my, my camera. Um, I think that's something that I can't rectify at the moment. So probably we can proceed. All right. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sure the content is what matters more than the image. <laughs> I agree right. with you. So I'll dive right into the question, sir. The first question, of course, is why should I pay tax if I have sold on credit? Okay, um, on that question, um, the way we, we see it um, from this end, uh, where the taxpayer asks, yeah, why should I pay tax if I've sold on credit? There are two issues probably that we, we need to address on that question, because basically there are two tax heads that are affected. Uh, I'll start with uh, the income tax. Um, section eight of the income tax uh, talks about um, gross income, uh, whereby if, uh, 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 if they, they are some accruals, uh, a taxpayer is supposed to account for, for, for income tax, uh, whether he has sold on credit or, or not. Then when it comes now to um, someone who is selling in installments, now section 17 um, of the income tax uh, now talks of uh, uh, installments whereby you are supposed to pay VAT to the extent of the uh, installment that you have received. So basically, when it comes to VAT, it's to the extent that uh, of, the, of, the, of, of, of the amount that you have received. You only pay VAT to the extent of the installment that you have received. Um, when we're looking at this question, uh, we maybe matched it with uh, some of our stores uh, who sell uh, on credit, probably uh, like clothes, clothing sell, uh, uh, shops, and um, other, 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 other taxpayers. So basically, that's our, our response to, to that question. Why should I pay tax if I've sold on, on credit? All right. Thank you very much, sir. I'm not sure if you've got any comments on that, Mr. Charangwa or Mr. Nyazungu, before I proceed. I can go ahead. 
Okay, great. The the oh. next common question is. Oh, I'm not sure something. All right, go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, sorry, Tendai. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we've got one of our colleagues who, who doesn't have a facility to to speak. Uh, now I don't know if you can just give him a uh, that facility. He, he wants to add more. All right, I've gone ahead and added Madam Teresa to the meeting. I am not sure if there is another member who had joined in. Yes, Simbarashe now. All right, excellent. So as the audience can see, we've done our very best to get as many experts and um, officials from Zimra to fully address all the burning questions that you have. So you've got a very capable panel here. So feel free to keep the questions coming in, both on our Facebook uh, page and on our um, question and answer section here on the Zoom link. So feel free to keep the questions coming in, both on our Facebook uh, page and on our um, question and answer section here on the Zoom link. All right, if everyone is with us, I will proceed to our next question. The next question that many people have started asking you is what exactly is fiscalization? Uh, on that question, I'll ask uh, Mr. Charangwa to answer that one. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, sir. Yeah, fine, thank you. Um, basically, uh, fiscalization is, um, uh, is, is uh, the recording of um, taxable sales or information through the use of a fiscal device. Uh, this is uh, in terms of um, SI104 of 2010, which, which was later um, amended by SI148 of 2016. And it, it mainly affects um, clients who are VAT registered. They are required to record their sales using a fiscal device. I would say in short, that's fiscalization. Okay, excellent. Fiscalization explained in a nutshell from the tax man himself. All right. So the next logical question then is why? Why should I fiscalize or who should fiscalize rather? Okay. Um, All VAT registered clients uh, are required to fiscalize. Uh, initially, it was um, when it was introduced in 2010, it, it started by targeting those who in category C. That is by then we had um, sales of about 240 US thousand and above. And then in um, it was then amended by SI 148 of 2016, which included the uh, the, all the other categories, that is A, B, and, and D. So basically, it's all VAT registered clients are now required to fiscalize. And this is a statutory requirement in terms of SI 104 of 2010. It's amended by 148 of 2016. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Charangwa. Now, is there any assistance that Zimra is giving in acquiring a device? And is the device fee claimable? Okay. Uh, the assistance that we are giving is, uh, is um, once you buy a device from an approved supplier, uh, you, are sub you are allowed to claim 50% of the cost of the device as input tax. Uh -huh. And then the other fifty percent, you claim it as capital allowance. So in short, um, the total cost yeah, you can claim it and submit your returns. That that that's that's the best we can assist the clients in terms of um, uh, uh, managing the cost of fiscalization. All right. Thank you very much, sir. And I'll take this opportunity to welcome the participants that are just joining us, um, both on in our Zoom meeting as well as our Facebook page. 
If you are just joining us, we've got Mr. Kennedy Charangwa, who is with fiscalization at Zimra. We've got Mr. Simbarashe Nau, who is with Zimra Technical Services. We've also got Mr. Knowledge Chirangazi, who is with the Zimra Help Desk and VAT Registration, along with Ms. Teresa Matsangura, who is the Head of Taxpayer Services. So a very accomplished panel here to disseminate information on taxes in 2001. Now, if there are no comments or questions, Mr. Nyazungu, I'll move on to our next questions. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, the audience would like maybe on fiscalization, they would like more clarification uh, with what was actually cited by the minister concerning those who are VAT registered because most of the people they are asking us about tax clearances and why they are failing to access their tax clearances because they didn't fiscalize. I think Zimra would like to shed more light on that. Ah, okay. Um, what was announced by the minister um, during the presentation of uh, the budget, um, he said um, all VAT registered clients are supposed to fiscalize and uh, ensure that their gadgets are interfaced with similar servers. Uh, interfacing is in terms of uh, SI 153 of 2016 again, whereby we are saying all those with physical devices, those devices are supposed to be linked to the similar server so that uh, information um, is transmitted uh, to similar servers. So uh, um, on ground, very few clients had managed to, to interface their devices and or, or, or even fiscalize themselves. So as a way of pushing clients to fiscalize, uh, the minister made a mandate that um, uh, you can only get test clearance once you have uh, completed the fiscalization process. So that's why uh, at the moment we are pushing clients and um, everyone has, has been blocked until they've um, they completed the process of fiscalization. I see, I see. Thank you very much, sir. We've got a question coming in from the audience, if you'll allow me to address those straight away. Um, the first one is saying, but there are no devices available. What, what's the status on the availability of these devices? Okay. Um, uh, we have, uh, I think, about um, 10 approved suppliers. There could be nine who are actively, or, or eight or nine who are actively involved in the market at the moment. Uh, the indication that we had um, was they have the, the devices in stock. But however, we have started receiving um, complaints that uh, they cannot get devices. So at the moment, we are in the process of engaging the suppliers um, to find out uh, their stock levels and when they are expecting um, their, their, their next shipment of stocks, because most of them, they, they import these devices. But um, I, I don't have the statistics at the moment uh, which, which supplier is, which type of device at the moment. But it's something like that we are working on to ensure that devices are, are available on the market. All right, thank you very much, sir. Uh, another question coming in from, uh, from an attendee within our, in our Zoom meeting. That's Elisha Chuma. Thank you very much for the question. He asks, what's the time frame for FRT1 registration from the date of submission of our form? Uh, the normal time frame should be about us, um, at least seven working days. But however, due to influx of um, FRT1s and also limited number of staff reporting due to uh, COVID-19 and also observing the social distancing in, in our offices. We have faced um, some challenges in terms of clearing the backlog was um, uh, the forms came in numbers and the staff was a bit short. But however, we have um, managed to start clearing the backlog by uh, extending our working hours to the staff and also working over the weekend. So I'm sure within a week or two would manage it, would have managed at least to clear the backlog. But suddenly that, that is making progress. 
All right, that's an honorable initiative, sir. Let's hope that backlog is cleared sooner rather than later. Yes, yeah, sir. Now, as we move on with our questions, the next one is what should be submitted for pre-clearance of imported private motor vehicles? Uh, thank you, Tendai. Uh, I think I will, I, will, I will take this question. Um, unfortunately, we could not get a representative from our customs department, but um, for the sake of this meeting, we, we gathered the information that uh, may assist the clients uh, who may want to do pre-clearance of their uh, private motor vehicles. So uh, if someone is importing a, a private uh, motor vehicle, uh, the requirements are as follows. Um, the first requirement is a bill of lading, uh, and the next one is an invoice. Then you also need to provide uh, the freight statement. On the freight statement, uh, you need to take note that um, there are two uh, freight uh, charges if the car is coming probably from uh, UK or Japan. There is uh, sea freight and uh, land freight. So uh, please take note that there is need to, to submit those uh, two freight statements. Then there is also export certificate. Uh, by export certificate, if the car is coming from Japan, they issue what we, uh, they call export certificate. An export certificate shows that the car has not been uh, 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 stolen. It's, it's, it's proof that the car is, uh, is authentic. Then if it's coming from uh, South Africa, you, you need to get what we call a SAPCO uh, from, from, from South African police services. Then um, the other requirement that you may need if the car is coming from uh, UK is uh, a reg book, um, a registration book uh, from, from South Africa or from Botswana or any other, other country, you need the registration book for, for that vehicle. Then also you need to uh, uh, attach probably uh, the ID for, for the importer. It's very important uh, since the car will be uh, registered in the name of uh, that importer. Another document that is uh, uh, now required uh, for those who are importing uh, vehicles for commercial purposes um, is a tax clearance. So if you're importing a motor vehicle, which will be used for commercial purposes, uh, let's take, for example, if a company is importing a, a, a Honda Fit or a, a, a car, just a, a, an ordinary uh, 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 private car, uh, that car uh, will be cleared um, uh, for commercial purposes. So you need to provide a tax clearance. So these are the, the requirements that you, you, one needs to, to, to provide uh, to facilitate a pre-clearance of uh, a, a motor vehicle. So. Uh, uh, with this, I think uh, we can we can move forward. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Knowledge. I think uh, just as an additional question on that, I think maybe we would want to shed light on the uh, uh, clearing of uh, motor vehicles, which are which were manufactured in year 2010. Going onwards, I think we might need to also clarify on that because our audience, it seems they're also asking about that. What was really said concerning the year 2010 in terms of uh, clearing the vehicles? Okay, uh, thank you, Jerry, uh, for, for that question. Um, unfortunately, we could not get a clarity on, on that uh, question, but uh, I'll answer uh, based on my, on my knowledge. Um, we could not get a statutory instrument uh, from the minister, although the minister on, on the 26th of November mentioned that um, uh, motor vehicles uh, above uh, 10 years will not be, be allowed uh, into Zimbabwe, but uh, there is no uh, statutory instrument to that effect as of now. Uh, thank you very thank much you. For, for clarifying that, Mr. Knowledge. I think I'll actually take one of the question on Zoom from Mr. Brian Zombe. He is asking, what is the current threshold for a company to register for VAT? Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I, I think I can take that question as well. 
um, the current threshold for VAT registration has been uplifted from 1 million to 4.8 million Zimbabwean dollars. Thank you. I think that one is actually clear to Mr. Brian. We can move on with our Zoom questions as well. I think keep them coming. Very soon, maybe we'll be actually opening to the floor so that they can ask you the Zimra guys directly. But for now, let me take another question. What is the requirements for an SME startup to get a tax clearance? Do we need to fiscalize even before conducting any trade? Um, on that question, I'll ask Mr. Charangwa to answer that one. Um, if the SME is a uh, VAT registered, yes, they are required to first of all uh, do the fiscalization process. But however, if they are not uh, uh, VAT registered, then they can apply their test clearance normally without um, uh, going through the fiscalization process. Because only VAT registered clients are required to fiscalize. Thank you, Mr. Charangwa. I think with uh, Mr. Charangwa as well, there's, a, there's one of your client who is asking, why are there delays in approving VAT registration applications, sir? Um, um, I'm sure knowledge, knowledge will take that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jerry. Uh, when it comes to VAT registration applications, um, the delay only comes when the supply when the when the taxpayer is not compliant uh, with the with the requirements. Because remember, we have got uh, certain requirements that are needed before you can be registered for VAT. So usually, um, the taxpayers they submit documents, but most of them they won't be enough for us to uh, trigger the registration process. That's one of the delay. Then another delay comes uh, when it comes to maybe probably getting hold of the public officer. Um, some of the public officer will not be available when you want to do a short interview. So that will cause some of the delays. Then another delay comes uh, probably when you have engaged a, 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 a consultant, uh, some of the consultants, they don't have enough information. They will say, can you speak to the public officer? So uh, those are some of the, of the delays. But if you submit your documents and um, uh, if you submit all the requirements, uh, the turnaround time will be a week or maybe 10 days maximum. Thank you. Uh Thank you very much for, for, for that clarification. I think it's clear to our audience. Maybe just a, just a follow up question on that. Uh, who actually qualifies to be a consultant dealing with Zimra? Uh, when it comes to the requirements for one to be a tax consultant, uh, there are uh, consultants that are renowned which we all know, uh, which are probably registered with the Zimra, we've got their BP numbers. But there are some, uh, maybe what you can call touts. I don't know if I can call, uh, if I can say that way, Mr. Jerry, you, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, you as m and you are registered with the Zimra, right? Yes. You, you, you are a tax consultant, you are registered. But those whom I can call touts, those are the, the the the, the 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 consultants who just roam around Zimra uh, uh, offices looking for, for for clients. So if you approach those ones, they tell you I'm a tax consultant. They are not even registered with Zimra. They are not even contributing anything to the fiscals. So what I can call for now to be our tax consultants are those who are registered with the Zimra. Those who are not registered with the Zimra, they are not tax consultants. They are just out. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for doing justice to that one, because uh, maybe our, our clients are being actually shortchanged, then ends actually causing delays in them accessing their tax clearance, their VAT registrations, like the one was asking. Maybe I'll just add another question, uh, which is on Zoom again. Why is the e-service still down during the day and night? Um, 
I'm sorry, I'm not sure if Mr. Chigwanda is in now. Uh, Mr. Chigwanda, is, is he available? Or maybe the boss can take it, uh, Ms. Matana Ungra. Yes, Mr. Chigwanda is not with us yet, unfortunately. So, ma'am, you can go right ahead. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello, uh, Madam Boss. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I think I would want to apologize for the inconveniences and the frustrations that our clients are facing as a result of the our e-services platform. And I know usually the, the platform is usually very congested during due dates but of late because we are behind with our uh, the issue of tax clearance i can just imagine that it must be a nightmare even uh, during the day even on any other day on any other days which are not really due dates so this is a system that is actually going through some challenges, although we are attending to the challenges. Unfortunately, uh, since I'm not that technical, I can't really say uh, when the system will be up and running, but we are aware of the challenges that our clients are facing. And as you know, we have actually had to, to give public notices uh, on that effect, but we are trying. That's why even Mr. Chikwanda is uh, a supervisor in, in that section. He can't be with us because they are busy attending to those challenges because he is with the e-services. So we will just take each challenge as it comes when our clients write to us, but the long and short of it is we are aware that the system is giving a lot of challenges uh, to our clients. We are also frustrated with the system as users. So I hope, um, the issues will be resolved soon. Thank you, ma'am, for taking that one. Thank you very much. Uh, I think maybe just as an add-on. So what are you currently doing maybe yeah. as an option to service our clients? As we know that Zimra is actually here to serve. Uh, when someone maybe was a first, a lot of questions were by people, they want to clear their goods maybe the border posts, but they are failing to do so because they can't access tax clearances on the e-service platform. What is Zimra doing in order, maybe another option B, uh, for getting tax clearance? Uh, okay. Um, I think the first initiative, especially in this year, 2021, is when we gave a public notice which will, which said that to from the 1st of January to 31 January, the last year's tax clearances were still valid. And actually we, we on that public notice, we assumed that everyone is a tax clearance. It was a way of trying to, to, to do away with the inconvenience that is caused with already registered clients uh, who could not access their 2021 tax clearances. But I know it was a disad it was not an advantage to those that were not yet registered then. But for those that were registered, at least from 1 January to 31 January, they could trade with no one uh, without having to, to have someone to withhold their, you know, 10% that withholding tax on tenders. And for now, after 31 January, we are issuing manual tax clearances. So the e-services department is busy. They've been working Saturdays and Sundays trying to, to cover the gap because we are issuing tax clearance certificates manually. Like I'm saying, the system is really giving us problems, but um, at least we have a solution. It might be a bit slow, but um, efforts are being made to make sure that clients have their tax clearances for 2021. So for anyone with a challenge, please get in touch with our e-services guys so that you can get your manual tax clearances. And for those that are up to date, they are being given full, full year tax clearances. 
that is the one that is valid up to 31 December 2021. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, Madame Lorraine Vigno, you have been answered because uh, she had said, uh, please clarify how one can apply for the manual tax clearance. I think that one has been answered. Uh, Tinda, you can take over the questions. Do you have any questions to aside? Thank you, sir. I've noticed a few questions in from our attendees who are seeking the best way to get in touch with Zimra. And they seem to be having trouble with the platforms that they're trying to use to actually contact the agency. So maybe we could clarify what exactly is the best way to get in touch. Well, um, you notice on our on the public notices that we are issuing out in the papers, uh, we have our email addresses and contact numbers that uh, our clients can use to to get in touch with us. Unless the question is that they are not getting any response, or if the client is not aware, then we can forward those details. All right, thank you, ma'am. So moving on to our questions. The next one is, what are the implications of value added withholding tax on taxpayers? Uh, thank you, uh, Tendai. I'll ask uh, Simbarashi now to take that one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chirangana. Well, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, from the question, I failed to understand what exactly you were trying to say, but I would like to come it from this perspective that we should understand what we hold in tech. Text is and how Zimra and why was it introduced? Well, the withholding text was introduced through this VATX. Section 50A, which allows the commissioner to appoint agents. These agents' duty is to collect VAT on behalf of the commissioner. So how do, how do these agents operate? Well, they are appointed agencies, which are mainly, maybe if when we, this was introduced, it was introduced in 2017, and a few large clients were appointed as agents, whereby they will be withholding two thirds of the VAT charged to, from their suppliers. So this VAT would allow the supplier to claim the amount which was withheld by the agents as an input tax, and you would only remit a third. This would also help the commissioner to administer the collection of tax in a way which is manageable to him, in a way he will be able to follow up on the large clients, which are the agents, to remit the two thirds which they have withheld to the small clients, rather than for the small clients to withhold the amount in full, as these small clients may be operating or may be delaying these payments to Zimra. So that is why these withholding tax on VAT was introduced. So these taxes, although they affect those, the people which are not the agents, is two thirds will be withheld from them. But however, it also helps the authority to administer the VAT which has been collected. And this will also pose challenges to the, to the suppliers, but I think from the Zimra perspective, we haven't had any challenges yet as all the suppliers are allowed to claim the input tax on their returns for the amount without. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Well noted. Now, the next question we have here is on transfer pricing. What exactly is transfer pricing? 
Uh, I'll ask Ms. T now as well, uh, again, sorry, to take that question. All right, thank you very much, thank you very much, Mr. Knowledge. Well, transfer pricing, transfer pricing, we can say it's an accounting taxation practice, and we can say it allows transactions within businesses or associates. Maybe we can say between companies within the same control or the same ownership. So we are sort of monitoring to see if these transactions has been done on an arm's length agreement, whereby we are saying which the price you have used, is it the same if you were going to sell or if you were going to transact with someone else who, of which you have no relationship with? So these are transactions between related parties. It can be internally within Zimbabwe, or it can also be across borders, transaction between companies across borders, although or they should be under the same control of ownership. So there is an introduction of the transfer pricing whereby you should, we as Zimra would like to understand more of such transactions that have transpired between parties with a relationship and whereby have you declared it or have you not and what amount or at what transaction or at what can I say? At what amount have you declared this transaction and at what price have you charged this related part of yours? So this is, in a nutshell, I can say this is transfer pricing. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I think I've got a question to Mr. Knowledge. There's a client, Mr. Brian Zombe. He wants to clarify something. Sorry to take you back uh, to importation of a commercial vehicle. Say a company is importing a Honda Fit and an individual is importing a Honda Fit as well. Uh, all other specifications of the vehicles are exactly the same. Do these two pay the same amount of duty. I think he's Thank just you. asking the difference between the company and the individual operating or importing the same car. Is there a difference between on the duty? Thank you, Jerry, uh, for that question. Uh, the two will pay this exactly the same amount of duty. Unless um, if maybe an individual is uh, bringing the vehicle, driving the vehicle, uh, there is that rebate uh, of uh, $200. I'm not sure if it was revealed. Um, that can only lower the individual's uh, duty, uh, uh, but it won't be that much. But when it comes to uh, a, a, a motor vehicle that is uh, coming maybe through a career, there is no uh, 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 that uh, rebate. So the two will pay the same uh, amount of duty. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I think uh, let me actually add another question from our Zoom platform. We know that there's a pandemic, hence we can't access the offices, but it's taking too long to get responses from your, uh, our liaison officers. What really can be done to get your help? I think that one was actually answered, but if you, maybe you want to clarify that as well, Mr. Knowledge, I think you can go ahead. Um, I think on that one, it was uh, uh, touched on by uh, the head technical services, Ms. Matangura. Like any other organization, uh, we uh, at Zimra, we are operating with uh, skeleton staff. We are not at full capacity. And um, you will find that uh, we are receiving probably a thousand or more emails a day or so because of um, uh, the challenges that um, our clients is, uh, are facing. So we, we are trying by all means probably to try and um, uh, 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 answer as, as much as we can. But, um, you know, the, the situation that we, we, we are in is just like the new normal whereby um, we are having challenges like any other organization. So, 
what I can say is we are trying to resolve the client's problem. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Knowledge. Uh, I think uh, Tendai, we can actually, maybe we can start taking questions from the floor. Maybe they can just indicate if someone wants to speak to the guys, then you can unmute their mic. Are we, are, can we, are we able to do that? Yes, we should be able to do that. Yeah. So um, to those in attendance, you, if you have a burning question, you're free to just raise your hand and we will address as many questions as we can. We've got an expert panel from Zimra today who are happy to assist you as best they can. And maybe while we wait for those questions to keep coming through, there is another question we had here, which we can address in the meantime. The question of course was, what are the benefits of youth employment credit? Uh, thank you, Tendai. I will ask uh, Simbarashe now to take that question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, would like to define the um, credit. Well, the Finance Act was granting credits to the employees before the introduction of the Youth Employment Credit in the Finance Act number three of 2019, whereby it now allows the employers to claim a credit. This credit is now for youth employment. And how does one claim this credit as an employer? Well, the employer should be one who is a qualifying taxpayer, whereby the, it can be a company, it can be a trust, it can be an individual, but who is engaging in trade and investment. And this qualifying taxpayer should be employing employees which are deemed to be youth, which are said to be aged between 30 years or less within the year of assessment. And the definition of an employer so the definition of an employee will exclude one, a trainee, an intern, and an apprentice or any other youth who is holding a managerial position. So these people are excluded from the youth credit that can be claimed by the employer for employing youth. And the amount that can be claimed by the, by the employer for employing the youth is, it was raised to 1,500 per month per employee, up to a maximum of 180,000 per year. So that is the limit that the employer is allowed to claim as a credit per year for all his employees. So in a nutshell, I think that is the youth employment credit which was usually or which was being enjoyed by the employees through the medical credits, through the elderly credits, but has now been considered down to be enjoyed by the employers themselves by claiming the credit through the youth employment credit. I thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I know Solomon Goredema had his hand up. I think he's lowered it since then, but he has submitted two questions via our question and answer section. I'll go ahead and pose those to you. He asks, what is the threshold for the WHT for those without tax clearance for 2020 and 2021 year of assessment? And then goes on to ask the second part of the question, given that a supplier fails to meet the minimum threshold stipulated for the WHT in a year of assessment, do we withhold 10%? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tendai. Uh, I'm sure by saying WHT, uh, it means a withholding tax, right? Yeah. So uh, the threshold has been, has been set um, at 80,000 Zimbabwean dollars um, for withholding tax. So if someone 
doesn't have a tax clearance, um, the, 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 the threshold is now 80,000 RTGS dollars or Zim dollars. That's the first part of the question, right? So uh, I didn't get the, 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 the second part. Please, uh, can you come again? Okay. The second part was given that a supplier fails to meet the minimum threshold stipulated for WHT in a year of assessment, do we withhold the 10%? Uh, certainly, no. You will not uh, withhold the 10% if the supplier uh, fails to meet the minimum threshold of 80,000. So if someone supplies you goods of uh, 50,000, 60,000, 70,000, which is less than 80,000, you will not withhold the 10% uh, 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 withholding tax. But if it surpasses now the 80,000 minimum threshold, that's when now you deduct the 10%. Thank you.